Oh, that takes a second. <laughs> It's gonna be fun. You're good at this though, so. It says we're live right now, so. All right, uh, I'm going to give everybody another uh, couple minutes or to, to get uh, to hop on and then we're gonna start this thing, so. Can you bring me a water, please? Uh, yeah, I'll have someone get you a water. Um, okay. Uh, all right, I think it is time to start. Let's see. Okay. All right, here we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our uh, substance abuse use conference uh, known as Walking the Red Road Together. I am your host for the week. My name is Chris Shaw. I am the prevention coordinator here at Two Feathered Native American Family Services. And uh, I am excited to get this webinar and this uh, week started for you guys. Um, so hello. Um, this series is a series that's put on by our youth. It is um, put on by our, our kids that you're gonna see today and by me. Uh, it is uh, meant to highlight the kids and meant to uh, have a conversation between some of our, our youth and some of the elders that are, are uh, not elders, because Michael get mad at me if I say that, but some of our older, uh, more seasoned people and telling their stories. So um, before we do start, I want to acknowledge that, uh, I have a little saying right here, that uh, I wanna honor and pay tribute to the land that we're on here in Humboldt County uh, and say that we acknowledge the people that we are tribe, the Hoopa, Karuk, uh, Yurok, and Talawa, the people who are made up this land. Uh, so I wanna acknowledge them. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that there are some topics here that will be kind of sensitive so if you're gonna be on, I need you to, uh, are we gonna be here? There will be some uncomfortable stuff but people will be telling their stories. Um, so that's uh, stuff I wanna know before we get started. So I'm very, very excited to introduce these two boys who are on here with me today. Um, both of these boys are smart boys. They are both just graduated from Hoopa Valley High School on Friday. And they are, to be honest, excuse my language, two of the biggest smart asses I have ever met. So um, I'm gonna introduce first, uh, Mr. Milton Mabry. Milton, uh, how are you today? And tell us a little about yourself. Pretty good. Uh, my name is Milton Mabry. I just graduated from Cooper Valley High School. Free sport athlete, football, basketball, and baseball. Grew up in Hoopa, the youngest of nine. Plan on attending College of the Redwoods and Hoopa next year before I transfer to Shasta College to work on heavy equipment. And I'm looking to be a role model among, amongst my friends and change the way they look at drugs and alcohol. Thank you, Milton. Happy to have you on with me. Now I have uh, Mr. Joseph Lewis. Joe Lou, how are you doing today? And tell us a little about yourselves. I'm doing um, fine. My name is Joseph Lewis. I'm 17 years old. I have Hoopa and Iraq descent. I graduated from Hoopa Valley High. I lived in Hoopa all my life. I am the son of my mom, Raylan Davis, and my dad, Norman Lewis, the grandson of Reggie Davis, and my grandma, Ethel Davis. My goal here is in participating in this conference to be a leader in my community and help change the negative impact that drugs have on it. Thank you, Joe Lou. I'm um, excited to have both of you boys on here and excited to hear your guys' stories and uh, hear what you guys are uh, have to ask Mike. Uh, so our special guest today is uh, Mr. Mike Duncan. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself uh, before we start on our intro. Um, so uh, how are you today? And tell us a little about yourself. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Mike Duncan. I am a Round Valley enrolled member of Round Valley Indian Tribes. I'm Maidu. Wailaki, Wintoon, 
on my father's side and a Western branch of Shoney Tomoke out of Western Nevada on my mother's side. Um, a father of five, five children, um, three boys, two girls. Um, I am also um, the CEO of Native Dads Network out of Sacramento, California. Um, currently, I live in um, Woodland, California, working at Northern Valley Indian Health as well. So I'm a jack of all trades. I'm a substance abuse counselor here. And so I've been doing, I've been here for about, well, I've been a counselor for about nine years. Uh, yeah, about nine years. And, uh, but I've been working at the clinic here for about four years at Northern Valley. So I'm a, I'm a jack of all trades here. I do a lot of different things. Thank you, Mike. I'm happy to have you here with us. Uh, I know that you have a very interesting story and you have uh, told me and the boys this already, but uh, I would like to hear your story. And then after that, the boys have some questions for, uh, for you and we're going to start our little round table. So uh, the floor is yours. Please tell us your, uh, your story. Well, thank you for having me again. I am, uh, you know, one of the things I get really, I mean, last night I was uh, thinking about this, you know, yesterday was Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. You know, uh, you know, this is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing, you know, we get to celebrate our dads. You know, one of the things I didn't share a little bit earlier is that I, I do programming. Uh, I'm also a, a trainer, consultant, um, and facilitator of the uh, curriculum Fatherhood is Sacred. And I've been doing that for about, um, shoot, since 2000, uh, like 2009, I've been doing that program um, all over here in California and, and through the states, but mostly here in Northern California, training people or helping uh, tribes or organizations, get native organizations, start a program. And so I'm really excited about that. So yesterday, Father's Day, I got an opportunity to sh uh, share that time with my father. And that that's always special with me, special to me, you know, because, you know what I mean? We have to, you know, I think one of the things I get, as I get older now, I'm starting to appreciate the time that I get to spend with my father because he's still here on earth and uh, you know I don't I don't uh, take that for granted anymore like I used to you know uh, as, as I was when I was younger <clears throat> well so I'm really excited that last night when I was at over there I was kind of just sitting you know with my dad and I, we were just kind of talking about today and um you know this morning I got really excited you know and, you know one of the things I'll just be honest that like, I think at the beginning of all this when I started doing this kind of work wellness since uh, I uh I started thinking like, uh, well, I wanted to work with fathers. Um, I guess because I was really new that I, I didn't understand or uh, I didn't, I guess maybe I'll put it this way. I didn't, I didn't see the importance of working with youth, you know? And, uh, and so today, you know, it's, it's different for me. I understand that, you know, that uh, working with youth is a vital component of changing the future or making our future thrive. And, you know, I do my best, you know, I don't know everything. You know, I don't, I don't know everything and I don't, I don't pretend like I do know everything. Um, but there are some things that, you know, um, because my own personal experience with some things that I feel like I have something to, something to contribute, you know, to the youth. And it's not so much something I learned in school, it was actually life experience. Um, something that you read about in school or you go through, as you go through curriculum, you're kind of going, oh, this is what an alcoholic addict is or this is a person that kind of use drugs or alcohol, you end up here, that's kind of the consequence. Um, or, you know, you use drugs and alcohol, you lose your family, there's that kind of consequence. You know, there's all these things that, you know, you read about or you, you know this could happen or if you know people like that. Well, my experience is that I did all those things. <laughs> it wasn't something that, you know, that I, um, I'm proud of, but I will say that because of my recovery or kind of my wellness or the healing I've done, that I understand today, like those are the tools that I have to help other people. Because <clears throat> people have to understand or start to look at, um, you know, that people or start to see that people can heal through this. And that, you know, um, the things that were passed forward, uh, like we know a lot more today than we did. I'm, I'll be 49 this year, 40 years ago, <laughs> 49 years ago. We know a lot more today than we knew back then. We know the outcomes of alcohol. We know the outcomes of drugs. We know the outcome like, of prison or jails. And, um, and since that time, or even prior to that time, um, our ancestors or the people that came before us, they've been working and, and developing curriculum, um, preaching culture, preaching other things to help us heal. Um, 
Now it's our choice whether, you know, as adults or even young adults, whether to pay attention and listen to those things, listen to the elders, listen to those teachings. It's up to, it's, it's, it's up to each individual. Uh, because sometimes we I mean, because when we're living through it and if we don't have the support or the resources, then sometimes, you know, uh, it'll go in one ear out the other. You know what I mean? Because reality is that, you know, this is all I know. There is alcohol around me. All there is is drugs around me. And um, that's my normal. And so what we're trying to do or what this program is trying to do, and, and I'm also on board with that with Two Feathers and other organizations throughout California, we're trying to work with uh, youth and try to teach them something different. You know, I mean, try to show them something different so they don't have to go through what we gone through. Right. It's very important. And so I'm very proud of Milton and Joe of stepping up because it takes a lot of courage upon your peers to say, you know what, I'm going to stand for something different. And I'm not even going to stand in front. I'm going to go on the live broadcast that's going to be seen by thousands of people to say that this is what I stand for. And this is what I want. My team. It, takes a, it takes a lot of courage to do that, even as an adult. So I can imagine how hard I because I, as a youngster, I fell for a lot of peer pressure, you know. And so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you guys, you know, for asking me and being part of this circle um, and also to share this time with you, because I if you're doing this now, I, I can imagine what you're going to do in 15 years or 10 or 15 years. You're going to be out there just on the front and um, just know that I have a small piece of, of, of that. You know, what I mean, it makes me feel good, like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. But back to my story, I, um, I think one of the things that's important for me to, you know, like I said, I've done a lot of healing work. so. Um, and I don't mean to share things that will trigger people or get people upset or um, um, or say anything negative or something too upfront. I I just have to be, I just have to be I just have to be honest. I have to be true to myself. Um, you know, I've, I've experienced alcohol uh, alcohol at a very young age. Um, I started drinking. I took my first. I, well. You know, of course, you know, family member, being around family, you know, there's alcohol around. So I seen it. It was very normal in my in households that I used to go to as a youngster or family gatherings and things like that. Um, but, you know, so I've always seen those things. I remember being really young, grabbing beer cans and, you know, adults taking them from me or even taking little small sips and adults taking them from me. Um, but eight years old, I remember being um, in school and um, we got out early from school one day and I was very and I didn't fit in because I was, I was raised in Sacramento mostly. And um, I was uh, the Indian kid uh, in my school with long hair. And, you know, I always got teased. I was got teased at a young age and uh, for having long hair. I was called a B word. I was called, you know, the F word. I was called girl. Like, you know, all these I felt very out of place there and <clears throat> a very different time then. And um, and kids made fun of me all the time, and I didn't like it, and I didn't know how to tell that to my parents at that time. Um, you know, because it wasn't like you know today they have like anti-bullying campaigns and all these other things. None of that was available, so no one not saying anything was normal. And growing up, you know, and and so when I started wanting to make friends, I always wanted to have this this want to have friends or people to like me. As somebody asked me if they wanted to hang out after school, and um, so I followed these kids, um, and they when I got where we got like a little they had this little camp or a little fort set up. It was kind of cool with this little field, and uh, they had a six pack of beer right there. And they asked me if I wanted to drink uh, beer with them. And because I wanted friends so bad, because I felt so out of place, and that I had this uh, you know this need to be wanted, I said okay. Uh, because I felt like at that time, I can even remember to feel like, well, I know what beer tastes like. I know what it's about. I've seen this around in my household. And so, but I remember drinking that first beer and I remember like yesterday, it was, was it was nasty. It was like, but I continued to drink it because I wanted these people to like. And what I realized then, you know, um, and I'll, get, I'll, I'll give you the point of all this. What I realized then is that, you know, when I drank, I was funny. Like I'd say things and they would laugh. I would say things. I wasn't the nervousness of being around or having people like me. I wasn't, you know, that was gone. Like all these fears were and, and, and doubts were gone. And now I was more confident. And it was, it was life changing at that point, um, psychologically. Um, you know, I didn't drink after that until probably like I was in seventh grade. Um, but I still remember that. And I, when I got into seventh grade, um, of course, you know, there were skipping parties and um, or after school get togethers with all the kids. And and uh, when the alcohol broke out, you know, I knew exactly what it was going to do for me. 
I knew that I could, uh, you know, I could, I could get get some courage and talk to a girl and not worry about being rejected. I knew that, um, you know, if there was a guy trying to bully me, I, I'll pump my chest out and I wouldn't act scared. Even though in my heart, I was kind of, I wasn't, I'm never, I'm not a fighter, even though I fought a lot as a young kid, I was always scared. Like, you know what I mean? And I was always, like I said, and I fit in because I would, I know what it felt like not to fit in, but when I drank and people wanted to be around me or I felt like they wanted to be around me. I don't know. So I carried that stuff carried with me all even through my age, you know, through years and, and, and through the years it developed into something deeper than that, um, like, like addiction, you know? And uh, an addiction part is, there's a couple of things that I understand now is number one is the component of like, number one, to make sure it's a physical addiction. Um, it's uh you know again it becomes psychological where you start to think you need it and then it also starts to destroy your life where you know i started getting in trouble with the law you know what i mean i started getting in trouble started getting little stupid things i started being out late cops pull up take me to juvenile hall and let my parents pick me up um, i started smoking weed because again that goes hand in hand I drink beer then you know someone comes around with a sack of weed and they want to smoke weed with you and that's something i did then and i didn't think of them big with a big of it you know and you know i as a parent today, <laughs> and I look at my um, and I, I look at my kids the same age as, as them. I was, you know, um, they're, they're the same age as, as I was when I started getting really in trouble. I, as a parent, I would probably fall out my chair if I put if my kids <laughs> put me through what I put my parents through. Um, so I'm thankful that they're they're walking a clean sober path right now, you know, and they're doing what they have to do is culturally. But I started getting in trouble through the years, and I got really dependent on. The idea of thinking that this was like a, a tool or a, a medicine or something that was going to help me get somewhere, uh, you know, from when I started working, um, started getting a job, um, you know, oh, I had a hard day at work and here I, I deserve this, this is what I, I'm owed and drinking beer um, to starting having kids or having children. Um, and Milton has a question. Good. Um, what do you think the like the gateway is? to like lead you, the gateways like alcohol or weed to lead you on to diff try different stuff? Well, I mean, a lot of people have different theories, I believe. Of course, they, people say that, you know, marijuana is a gateway, um, cigarettes, um, even alcohol at some point, because some people don't like alcohol, but they like marijuana, vice versa. But I think it's a mindset. You know, when you start to use something, no matter what it is, you build a tolerance. Um, and unfortunately, bad things happen when you start to build tolerance, whether it's physically or emotionally, mentally, or relationships or trauma, something starts to happen, other things start to happen. And so whatever that, whatever that pain you feel or whatever that stress you feel, whatever loss you feel, and, and maybe sometimes marijuana is not, ain't doing it no more because you have a, maybe a higher tolerance, you start to explore on other drugs to kill that pain, to kill that emotion, to kill the trauma. And so it continues on. Now, if you start looking at something healthy, you know, like, cause now I like this weekend we were in a ceremony and like traditionally when we look at Indian people, we knew that life gives, there's gonna be hardships in life, you know? There's songs, there's dances, there's, you know, there's doctorings, there's a you know, sweat laws, there's different things that people use to heal. So they didn't have to uh, sit in stuck in certain emotions. And what people do sometimes when they're when they're using is they're trying to kill the emotions. They don't feel things. But what happens is when you the drugs are say they sober up or they're not on the drug anymore, those things continue to pop up in your life. So you always got to use to kill the pain or kill the trauma right so it just keeps on growing and growing and growing and growing yeah joe yeah hey, um i have a question i know how um using drugs and drinking alcohol whatever when there was um a point when you first started like say you have ceremony and we have ceremony this point when you first started like using drugs using alcohol did you lose like a a sense of purity or like strength within yourself, like, like you don't feel as much of a stronger person as you was before the drug, like in a way of before alcohol. 
you know, I, I'll, this, I'll be honest, when I was younger, I didn't have the connection to that uh, of ceremony. Um, because I was in the city, you know, uh, it, wasn't as, it wasn't like living on the reservation. Um, I know it's sometimes people that use, they go to ceremony and they feel like that's gonna help them get through whatever pain, their emotions they're gonna, they struggle with, you know? Um, but you do live, lose a sense of yourself in, in some things. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know what those are, to be honest. I have to be like, like for me now, because when I made the commitment to ceremony again, I was completely sober. Now, I like how I feel when I leave ceremony. I like how I feel uh, when I'm in ceremony. I like the whole, all of that, you know, like, and so um, the fear is if I use again, I will lose something. You know what I mean? And I don't know what that is, but um, because I haven't experienced it, you know, I don't want to speak like I know because I don't know. But that I think there is a sense that people do think that uh, or feel that way or they're not worthy or they, they struggle with the self or, you know, because I don't know anybody that's used successfully. <laughs> I, I just don't. You know what I mean? That's the truth. I don't have any success stories of an old person going, I'm saying going, I thank God I used drugs my whole life. I don't know anybody that said that. <laughs> so, which tells me now is like, well, if we know that's the end story, the end consequence that people get older and they say, you know, I need, I try to quit now because I'm just, I need to be responsible. Makes me think like, well, man, a lot of us recovering people go, man, I wish I would have never used for the first, for the first place. Right, makes sense. But you know, one of the things that were uh, pretty powerful and impactful, and like in my life, you know, um, and I'm glad you mentioned that um, because there's like two stories, and I I share about my younger side because my younger or my youth because it, you know there was a lot of I get you know this is after doing some work on myself that I understand that like I was very a very insecure insecure person. Um, because again, some things that were, uh, like I said, being teased at a young age or find, figuring out who I was as a person or even as an Indian boy, like I didn't really understand that. It ain't like today. Like, like a lot of things are different, you know. <clears throat> there was nothing in our area that was uh, any resources um, to help promote healthy or recovery um, or even wellness. Or maybe there was and I wasn't interested. I was, I was very big into sports. But, um, you know, today, you know, one of the things that we recognize or what helped me get to this place was that it was started, I started having children. And, um, you know, I was wondering why, why, you know, how come I can't get well? Like my first two kids, I was still kind of in my addiction. Um, I was in and out of jails. Um, and I was really trying to figure out who I was. And I tried really hard a few times try to quit and try to live a different lifestyle it just didn't work for me you know and um uh, years went by and uh you know i i started having fallouts with like children's mother um and uh you know i started feeling sorry for myself uh, started getting to the pity pot and then i decided to change i said well i it came to a point where i started having more kids and i said man i need i need to change and this is why I know it's creator, you know, um, because change is so hard, you know, it's not, it's not easy. Because a lot of times when, when family members um, look at a person that's addicted, they just look and they shake their head because, you know, maybe they're disappointing their wife or maybe they become abusive to their family members or their children and, or they're in and out of jail all the time or they're never home and, or, or when they are home, they're always sleeping. Like, and they're like, just change for your kids. Can you do that? And people look at them and they might, and they get really upset with them, that certain person. And it's, it's disappointing. They think, and they go, why can't you just quit? Why can't you just change? And then children feel like, well, you ain't changed. I, I must not be worth anything, you know? And that's the struggle. Um, being a substance abuse counselor now, I understand that, you know, um, that change is very hard. It's one day at a time. Um, it takes a real desire and a person to want to want to get sober. It just takes that desire, right? 
And and so my job is to empower people to want to fill that fill their spirit up with desire. You know, like like keep your mind on the prize, right? Better you is a better father, better human being, or better mother, better human being, better spiritual person. And that way you can give those things back to your children. And I see I when I was in my in my addiction, I was coming out, I was getting out of I was in and out of jails and in our prison. I realized that, you know, um, I had to I had to change, you know, I, I just couldn't continue the path that I was on. And so that had had to do with a lot of prayer and a lot of uh, you know, uh, me paying attention to God. I mean, because creator was, uh, again, yeah, sending me signs or sending people in my life to help me, but I wasn't listening. Yeah, Milton, you have a question? Um, the first time you was in and out of jail, why didn't you change for your first kid? And like, I don't know. Yeah, that's exactly. I, I, um, well, I know we talked a little bit about this earlier. I think one of the things, um, and I'm going to open up because the, you know, it's it's a really uh, it still kind of hurts me a little bit, you know. What I mean, uh, but I need to be honest. And, and the thing is, when we when a person gets into it addictive, and I and I just really thought I was already a good person. <laughs> like I didn't understand what really what a father meant to be, what a father was meant to be. I thought that um, you know uh, when my me and his mom split up because uh, I was getting in trouble or. I wasn't coming home at night, things like that. When she left me, that I just still thought I was this perfect individual. That because I came on the weekend and picked up my kids, that um, that's what dads do, and, and I thought that was my only job to help them. You know, because um, I didn't really didn't fully understand because my whole life, it's up to that point from a very young age, alcohol has always been was my is in was in my life, was my friend, was my re relationship. I was in a relationship with alcohol. So giving it up was like, I don't know, not, I won't say it wasn't even a thought. It was so, it was so attached to me or, or my personality or my, uh, for me having fun or I didn't really realize the damage or the psychological damage it was doing to my kids, to my kids' mothers, to anything. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't, couldn't even see it. And it wasn't until years later, you know, and this, this is the thing, you know, uh, and if my son's watching, I love you, son. Uh, but, you know, um, you know, he came, it came to a point where, you know, I, he got tired of it. You know, he got, he had resentments towards me. He like, how come you just can't, like you said, how come you just can't quit? You know, don't you love me? You're never here, you know? And that always, that always hurt me in my heart. And I, I always, and then I beat myself up a lot for trying to figure that part out. Then, you know, what I mean, uh, of trying to, why can I do that for him? You know, but addiction—that's how strong addiction is. That's how I, you know, we wish that we couldn't have done. We should have stopped. Never began from the first, <laughs> from the first place to start. You know, and try to start and quit later on. You have another question? Go ahead. So the first time you was, like, you went out. When you had your kid well you we went in and then you went out of jail and you had your kid and then you went back what was your thoughts of like thinking like do you need to be there for your like you need to be there for your kid but like what was going through your head at the time well i think part of it now that i know what i know now is um is just totally selfishness you know uh, because i was used to not um <clears throat> how could i how long like so the selfishness part is where, like, when I looked at my kids' mother and, and my children and their mothers, is that they look like they were fine. And so I'm like, oh, they're doing good. They must, they don't need me to mess their life up. And so I separated myself. I don't want to, and I told myself, I don't want them to see me. I don't want them to see me in here. I don't want them to know what my life is about. Like, I was embarrassed. It's a lot of shame, you know? Um, and so I said, well, I'll just keep my distance. You know, and that way they could just be healthy or be better with off without me. But the fact, the truth is that, and this is the truth, all the kids, every kid needs their father. That's a lie that I told myself. And that was a cop out because it was easier for me to run from my responsibilities and hide from them than to be say, okay, enough's enough. Let me figure this out. Let me try to change, move for resources, let me move for recovery or anything else. 
you know. Yes, Chris. Uh, you talked about uh, having uh, that insecurity when you were talking about your kids, talking about your life. Uh, and I know that the boys and myself included are are always having this uh, insecure battle within themselves about insecurity and about being worthy and being good enough. So uh, hopefully you can talk about that and like how that has to do with you on your journey. Absolutely. And um, I think that's what we were, we were um, I, you know, I wanted to answer the, the uh, young boy's uh, question, the youth's question. Um, I think this is important to understand. You know, I, you know, um, there are a lot of questions with individuals or any youth listening out there that we don't, we don't understand sometimes what our parents are doing. You know what I mean? And that trauma or that insecurities or that or feeling lost, you know, it comes from somewhere, you know, being young, you know, and I realized this, you know, like I said, this is why I, like, I've done a lot of 12 step work on myself. I mean, I was in the program of Narcotics Anonymous for a little while. I did uh, Red Road meetings um, and then I went to counseling therapy. And so I've done a lot of digging with inside myself. And how I got to this place of insecurity, of understanding about my insecurity was kind of working on myself and saying, well, where's the root? Where's all this coming from? You know, where's all this struggle coming from? Because the day I wasn't born with it, but where's it coming from? And I and I traced it back to being very young and being like having long hair or looking different from the rest of the, the people that were in my community um, at that time in Sacramento and and, um, and being and then just wanting to be liked and being fitting in. And growing up, you know, that's kind of like where, you know, you realize that I still have that down deep somewhere. <laughs> It still kind of pops up like I just want people to like me. You know what I mean? I I don't want to say anything wrong because I don't want them to get mad at me. And and I'm working on those things. But what for you for you? And this is the thing when you look at self worth. Uh, hold on, Joe. I'll get to you. Um, for self worth is is understanding that. And I tell this to my kids all the time. Is that we want to go to school? You know now because we live like I said we live in Woodland. And I said, do you feel different in school? And they said. I, they say, yeah, we feel, yeah, we feel different. And I said, that's because you are different. You come from greatness. You're, you're native. You're, you're, you're powerful. You're not like everybody else. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. You have to realize that that's what creator blessed you with, being native. And then they started looking at that like, huh, yeah, I ain't like nobody else. And, you know, this kind of, as a parent, just feeding them that, you know, from a younger, like, you know, said like seventh or eighth, when they're seven or eight until now, now they got in their mind like, yeah, I'm native, I'm different, and that's okay, and that's a beautiful thing. And that's something that all parents or adults in, um, in our younger, in our younger generation, we gotta teach you guys that, how, how important you are to all this, right? All right, Joe, you have a question? Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask you a question because I've seen it and I know it from experience as a parent, and a person, where where do you find, I guess, the selfishness to where when you have still kids, you need to be grown up and still raised, and then you and your other partner or spouse would have just kind of want to give up on them entirely and don't 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 really, I guess, want to go down that parenthood path anymore, and then and then just you just life totally changes from being a parent and having kids to you know, being someone who's addicted to drugs and on alcohol, just, I, I just wanted to see where people find the selfishness. That's a tough question. It's a good question. It's super tough. <clears throat> um, the grips of addiction is a beast. And unfortunately, you know, uh, that grip doesn't let go of some people. That's, I think that's just the plain, honest truth. And, you know, um, it, it, it's the type of thing where, you know, um, the kids could be crying um, on a daily basis, begging their parents, and, and the parents just can't quit. And I think that's why these platforms are so important, you know, to, it's a message to the youth of like, this is all preventable, because if you're witnessing it, yourself with your own experience you're witnessing this it's a perfect example how not to be because you already know the outcome and this is kind of linked to what we call intergenerational trauma 
Like we know about historical trauma. We know like we're at losing a land, losing a language, losing a culture, but also with intergenerational, what's the outcome of historical trauma, right? Well, people feel low self-worth. They don't feel they're valuable. They feel that, you know, all these things. So they use alcohol or drugs to suppress it or to, they think it's medicine. They think it's going to lift them up or take the pain away, but the pain doesn't ever go away. And what happens is like with me, we talk about intergenerational is that I didn't want to pass this to my kids. I didn't want to give this to them. I didn't want to show them how to, how to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm thankful in that, in that sense. You know what I mean? And so, you know, I wish I had an answer, you know, a lot of, I've been to a lot of communities. I've been to your guys' community up there and, you know, there's, um, there resources are so valuable. Um, I think adult mentorship is so valuable. Um, youth need other youth, like I said, you guys and the other ones that are be on the panel this week, they need the youth to stand up and, and create like a safe environment for people to come in or youth to come in to know that they could be here safe and, and get that mentorship. Um, and they need people to preach, to preach uh, sobriety. You know what I mean? Uh, that's just the truth. You know what I mean? I'm, um, I know that like medical marijuana is the huge thing today. And I know that, um, you know, there is medical properties in it. And there's some things that with it that, man, I, I'm all for. But there's a difference between um, using uh, even recreationally to abuse. There's a very thin, actually a really thin line, you know, or even medical properties. And I'm not going to go into all that right now. But what I am saying is that because of uh, our history of addiction, you know, as, as um, you know, we're talking about not just where you guys are from, but all, all through the states, around the world, you know, addiction is huge. It plays a part in a lot of different things, right? But one of the things that I will hopefully um, that we could, you know, at least agree to, and if there's anybody that even people that do choose to indulge is that this is about healing what's inside, you know, whatever's going on here. And as Indian people, this means this is just the truth, is that we all of us have been affected by trauma somehow. Not one native person in this in this country is not been affected by historical trauma. Right? None of all of us have. And I don't care if you live in a big giant house or you know, you even know all your language. I mean you know, you're all your big got per cap. Like you've been affected somehow. You know, and that's what we have to come to grips to and 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 say out loud and say, well, what do I need to do for my healing? Because if I don't learn how to heal, I can't teach healing. Right? So we talk about intergenerational trauma, we gotta talk about intergenerational healing. And that's what like like this platform does because we're talking to the youth. And this is like how we're passing that forward. Not just the mess, we're passing the wellness forward. Thank you for uh, thank you for talking. That was a that was great. Um, so now what we're gonna have is uh, you're gonna ask the boys some questions, and if they're feeling up to it, they're gonna try to answer, try to help their community and help uh, kind of tell their story a little bit. So, but before we start that, I have a question for you and the boys that I think would be uh, uh, really think really helpful. Um, I know in most of these situations, uh, there's, especially when you're uh, in a native community or a native person, there's this feeling of uh, being a hypocrite or being a, uh, well, it's called, it's called, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's uh, a fake, like being a, being a fake person because you're trying to help uh, people go through those, do your story. So um, I'll start with you, Mike, and then I'll ask the boys, how do you, uh, kind of get through those insecurities of being a hypocrite, knowing that you've been through this type of addiction, knowing you've been through this type of things in your life and how can that uh, help other people see that there's another road? Yeah, you know, I, and I, I, I've experienced that, you know, like all of a sudden, Mr. Queen is sober, you're better than everybody else. Oh, Mr. Holy Man, now now you're all spiritual. <laughs> I, I've heard those, those, those uh, I guess, comments before. Um, I think it's important, and this is just for me, and, and I'll share this because, you know, um, Don Coy said it perfectly. He said, if you don't know what you don't know, then how would you know, right? And so I didn't know a lot of things, and it's no fault of my parents. Um, they did the best they could, 
you know, um, even my relatives, and they did the best they everybody did the best they could. Um, but what I realized, those things didn't help me none, right? It just didn't help me none. And and so, you know, if I want to become a better person, better human being, I want to be cultured, then I have to do the things to feed that. Now, I can't always worry about what everybody thinks. I think first off, you know, I want to make sure that number one, that I'm, I'm, I'm a good father. And if I'm going to be spiritual, I think, talk, and, um, you know, I think, talk, and act spiritual, you know, and, and those, or even if I'm sober, I'm saying, okay, well, that's why I share my story so much to, uh, publicly. It's not that I'm proud of being, you know, uh, a drunk or an addict, you know, and I, and I, and I, I'll just be, I'll even be more clear. I did alcohol. I've done meth. I did coke. I did pills, smoke weed. I mean, I, I did it all, but listen, let's talk about the people that we've lost. We lost a lot of people, friends, relatives, dads, moms. And I just made a decision that it just has to be done because I want a better future for our people. I want a better, better future for my family. And I can't take everything personal because that's the struggle. People struggle with that. Like, I can't worry about that. I have to worry about these youth. I gotta worry about the next generation. I gotta send them, they need somebody that's been through it that says, I've been through it, it's not good. This, I'm a, and I'm gonna show you by example, what, what a better life you could have like this. And that's my whole thought. And, and part of that is, is my prayer. Or it is the way I go to ceremony. If I go, if I, if I'm not spiritual, then why am I going to ceremony? <laughs> it's not a show. You know what I mean? I, I'm there to talk to Creator. I'm there to pray to my, with my ancestors. I'm there to pay for my own healing. And, and if people don't understand that, then um, I, that's not. I can't worry about that. I have to continue to do what I need to do for the healing of the future generations. Thank you. Uh... I know that uh, many many uh, indigenous people or native people suffer from what is called imposter syndrome, and they feel like they uh, they don't know what is what they're talking about because uh, they don't have those credentials. They don't have. Uh, they feel like they're not worthy enough to talk about it. But I'm telling you boys right now, and everybody who's listening, that people are listening to your story. Your stories matter, and you are not an imposter. You have lived through this stuff, and I would much rather. Uh, listen to what you you might have to say and what the boys have to say then read it in a book or read it in a text or whatever and uh to you boys this question is for you uh yeah from yvonne she says milton and joe a way to step up and show you guys are you could change and help others she's with a uh another youth and they want to know from you two boys where you guys found the courage to step outside of your comfort zone and talk to mike and be on this conference so uh Mike, if that's okay, I'd like to take the spotlight off of you and put it on the boys so they can talk about what got them to not be that hypocrite and not be that, uh, to try and help their community out. So, uh, Milton, I'll start with you. Um, I don't know. I really don't. Just be yourself. And, I mean, I was nervous coming into this, but I don't know. <laughs> Joe? For me, it must have been just just the personal issue, just with growing up, watching, you know, kind of like my mom, just the same way. Just I just always wanted to know, like what 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 made her decide to take I don't know, take her choices she did, and I just wanted to just to get to know it on a personal level for what I already had the trauma, and I just wanted to know how to get to know to help others and. Uh, just how to reach out and make sure that whatever they're going through, you know, they feel the same way how I feel about them. I just wanted them to know, you know, they could be comfortable or whatever. I just I had some experiences. So it's kind of why I wanted to help out and just let my word be heard. Thank you, boys. Uh, you guys are doing a great job and uh, you guys are a part of our youth uh, all the youth that we have with this week are all trying to step up in a certain way. Uh, you boys are just the start of that. So thank you boys for that. Um, Mike, this next question is for you. And then I'll have the boys ask you some more questions. Um, 
what can you say to these to these boys and have these boys say to uh people around them or people who are going through the same struggle that they have what can you say to them to have them to uh care about what they say and have their voices heard because these boys are doing a great job but i know there's other people who want to be want to fall in these boys of uh, role models and uh they don't know how to do that i think you hit it on the head chris earlier is like <clears throat> i would i much rather listen to these two boys and other youth and and um it's important it's something that you know um as adult that I know now, a lot of times like old teachings or um, is that again, you can learn from anybody, right? The youth, one of the things, the beautiful thing about youth, especially youth that are um, stepping in this, um, um, they have a, set, a certain level of, of honesty, a certain level of um, worthiness um, that you just feel like they have something to offer, you know? And it's beautiful to watch, even though you guys might not see it, I see it and feel it in your sincerity of being on this platform you want to be here you want to make a difference and that's so powerful you know a lot of times we try to model our and this is this for i'll tell you for me i want when i was when i was getting in recovery i was watching uh certain individuals um and how they did certain things and i kind of wanted to be like them but i didn't really find my my place in this world and doing what this work right here in this wellness work so i until i started being myself I really started loving myself and I and I started sharing when I started to share and and I want to tell Joe like man you know with your mother you know just real quick you know um that I just want to tell you you're worthy and it wasn't you that was a decision she made unfortunately you get the feel of the whatever happened you get you get you get that that's the consequence she gave you but you are worthy you're powerful and I man uh when you were talking, I almost teared up just listening to you because I know it's the sincerity, the sincerity that you were sharing. But this, um, the youth are so valuable; they have a lot to offer, and we have we as adults we have to listen to you because again, we if you have to tell us what you want, and that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you, uh, you two. Well, what do you think adults should do to support you guys? Because I think more adults need to hear like what you want. So that way we, we're always telling you what you should do. <laughs> we're always telling you what's good for you. And, and then we don't listen to, back to you to hear like, what do you want? What do you want in your community? You know what I mean? And so uh, I see uh, maybe Milton stepped off, but maybe we'll have Joe answer that. What do you think adults should do to support you? I feel like, yeah, <laughs> adults are always trying to tell us what we should do. I feel like in a way, even if you aren't, always there if you're not being the best a person even to your own children but others around it I feel like you should just try to find a way just to try to help out anyway just try to be there just try to always listen to what we have to say always try to just connect with us in a way just always you know keep keep an ear because we have a voice to be heard and we want someone to hear the voice and we want someone to just be there for us there's, there's a lot of kids out there who don't have anybody to be there for them even if it's just a person you see, you know, anywhere in a public place and you just want to talk with them, just always try to be there for them. I, I always need someone to talk to. A lot of times I don't have someone to talk to. And it's, it's great when I finally do get someone to talk to because it's, it's always having someone to be there for you. So, wow, thank you for that, Joe. Um, I know Milton's probably having some uh, technical difficulties right now, but we're going to ask the same question for him whenever he gets on. Um, for uh for Mike and then Joe, I'll talk to you about this too. Uh Joe, you are doing a great job right now of uh speaking your your own story. And Mike, you did a great job of telling your own story. Uh my question for you guys is when a time where everybody is trying to be like the perfect per per perfect version of themselves, uh how how important is it for you guys to be yourselves and how important is it for you guys to uh speak up for what you guys believe in and use your voice for exactly what you guys are doing right now and uh to talk about what you guys think is a problem in your community uh mike i'll start with you then i'll go with joe until milton's ready well i think it's that's something that i i shared a little bit earlier about when i was a, a youth you know um what alcohol did was change me and i i, I didn't want I, I fought really hard and to not be me because i didn't like me you know and 
I think the struggle is with a lot of people in the community. That's what I'm saying. And they start to experience alcohol or drugs. They don't, they're trying to find themselves. They're trying to find something. <clears throat> and so there has to be a point, like, and as adults, as we, we have to guide the youth and, and really honor them. Like, there's, this is how, this is why, like, puberty, uh, coming of age ceremonies or puberty ceremonies, they, they kind of tell you your Indian name, they give you your Indian name, they do the different things, or those things are important. But it's really about finding who you are without alcohol and drugs. You'll never find yourself inside with drugs or alcohol. Um, that's what, and people get stuck there. I, I'm just speaking from experience. Like when I started drinking and I started becoming changing with alcohol and everything, I started believing that's who I was. And then when alcohol and drugs were, I wasn't using, then I, then I was like, I didn't know who I was. And so I spent this last, again, 13 years of recovery now. I've been in recovery for the last 13 years, um, finding myself. And what I really, I found out that I, what I am is that I'm, I'm a good person. I'm a loving person. I'm an honest person. I'm a trusting person. I have integrity, you know, and it took me a long time to refine that again. But it's something that, you know, as a, as a young adult, that's what we should be guiding you to find yourself. You know, you'll never find it inside a bottle. You know what I mean? That's just the truth. You know what I mean? And so um, I hope that answers your questions. I, you know, I was going to go on to something else, so I had to shift gears a little bit. But I think that's part of just finding yourself um, first before we, you, you, you try anything that's going to be negative you put in your life or put inside your body. Yeah, that definitely answered the question. Um, so now I'll bring it to the boys. Um, what uh, what can you guys do to to have your voice heard or speak up? What uh, what uh, what helps you what helps you do that? And what uh, what is your what is your motivation? Uh, Joe, I'll start with you because Milton's having a bunch of uh, technical difficulties right now. Well, um, helps me do that. It's what helps I guess want my voice to be heard. I guess it's just like kind of like people like Mike. You know, he's he's been there. He's done that. You know, he's gone back for seconds, whatever. And I just like how people step up like him and try to be the best role model they can be and try to help others out. He's taken his own personal links and stuff to go and try to help people out. And I, I like that. I have very much respect for people like that, especially him. I like that he's trying to help us and trying to help others out as well. It's, it's awesome. It's a very, it's a very good thing what he's doing. I kind of respect it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Milton, you good? Are you able to uh, talk to us now? Yeah. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, it was uh, what 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 uh, was your motivation to speak up and uh, use your voice for uh, to help your community? Um, my motivation has been my coaches and people who have the same experiences as me. And I don't know. That's that's good. It's good to have someone who uh, you can look up to and have someone to be there for you. Uh, we have about five minutes before this is done. Uh, I want to kind of have you uh, boys, if you have any other questions for Mike or for uh, for me, um, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll I'll try to answer them. So boys, this is time for you guys to shine and ask your guys questions uh, before we end. Uh, Joe, I'll let you go first. Uh, I guess my question for Chris is um, when you decided to, uh, I guess, do this and pursue this career, this personal career, like what, what made the motivation for you to pursue like what you're pursuing right now to help, you know, us out and other people? Uh, that's good. Um, uh, my, my, honestly, my motivation is you boys. My motivation is you, Milton, all of you guys. I'm going to call some other kids out uh, later, but my motivation is you guys and seeing you guys grow and I'm pretty sure just like Mike is being that being that person who's there for you guys being that person is able to talk to people and showing you guys what uh I did with my life and having that uh having that uh space to talk to you guys because I know that when I was your guys age it was hard for me to talk to people so I want to be there for uh for you guys to talk so you guys are my biggest motivation uh yeah, so thank you for that question, Joe. Uh, Milt, you all right over there? You got any questions for us? No? Okay. Um, 
we have another uh, question from the comments. Uh, Christina, uh, she's she wants to ask a question to Milton. Uh, she's curious if uh, or how your identity as an athlete played a role in your leadership and uh, wanting to help others with uh, substance abuse and health. And in this building, I'm hoping you can kind of tell your story a little bit of uh, what happened to you and what uh, what uh, promote or motivate you to get to where you want to help people out. As an athlete, I have responsibilities to be a role model. And I think kids look up to me and I want to be a leader in the community. And when it was football season, I got into a bad car wreck through with the drunk driver. So it just changed my whole thing on life and how I look at things and stuff. But I just want to be a leader for like the kids in the community and stuff. Thank you for uh, for telling your story. Um, and for you guys who want to know more about Milton and more about Joe Lou, they will be with us on our um, youth panel on Friday. So please make sure you guys come back for that. Uh, one final question I have for all of you guys is before we end this is just, what is there anything uh, more we can do? Or is there anything more that you guys want to see in your community that this is just a first step in, into uh, into starting. So Mike, I'll, I'll start with you and then I'll, I'll go to the boys. You know what I would like to see? I would like to see um, more men step up to the plate and show these boys. I would like to see more men, father figures, uh, be good role models. Um, I, like I said, I've been sober 13 years now. And also I have, I quit uh, cigarettes 11 years ago or 12 years ago now. And um, 10 years ago, 11 years now, I quit cussing. Um, and I only say that because part of that is just me trying to be the best example that I can be. You know what I mean? I wanna watch my language, but I, I think one of the things that I, I, why I do the work of fatherhood and all those other kind of wellness things is really to, that men are needed. You Men are so needed in all this. And my hope is, you know, or my prayer is to, you know, to help men see that and to guide these young boys or our, our communities into a good place. So I'm calling out all the men. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Joe, I'll, I'll go next to you. What, uh, what more do you want to see in, in your community? Like um, Mike said, he's right. We need to see more men. We need to see more men. A lot of people come up to be they're like oh i'm a grown man you know i do this and that freaking you're not a grown man you're you're not you're not handling your business you you're not i'm sorry say that you might be old you might be grown up you might be this age but your own personal like level you're not a grown man you're still a little kid living in the past you need to man up take care of your responsibilities and and just start doing a lot better you are not a grown man until you know you have a responsibility to take care of me take care of them if you have something to do, you got to do it. That's just how it's done. You can't call yourself a grown man until you, you've done those responsibilities. Speak it into existence, Joe Lou. I like it. Uh, Milton, I'll go to you next. What uh, what do you want to see in your community? Um, more things to do with the youth, get the youth involved with things in the community. Uh, more role models who are sober and make and make a difference in the community oh wow that's you boys are uh, both on that path of becoming those people you say you want to be so i thank you boys for doing that and uh i thank mike for being on here with us that is just about the end of it um before we end it uh mike is there anything else you want to say before we before we log off yeah i just want to share that man um every everybody that's listening and 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 the boys here, all the youth, no matter where you're from, that I just want to tell you, you guys are worthy. I just want to tell you that each one of you are important. That you guys are special, and you're needed for this bigger picture of for our future. You guys are so important. I don't want to stress that stress that enough. And if you really, I mean, there's help out there. You just have to find it. You just have to be willing to say, okay, this is what I want, and and express yourself. And hopefully, people will listen. You know. Um, 
I know it's hard, but um, that creator has a plan for each one of you. He's got to continue to walk that good path. Go. Thank you for that. And we are more than happy to have you on here with us. Anytime you want to hop on again, we would love to have you. Uh, Joe, I'll go with you next. Uh, anything else you want to talk about before we, uh, before we log off? Uh, no, not really. All right, that was quick and simple. Uh, Milan, how about you? I just want to say thank you to Chris for making me comfortable and getting on here and stuff. Mike, you too, thank you. That that's thank you for being on here, Milt, Joe. Thank you, boys. Um, I am happy to be your guys' mentor, happy to be teaching you guys what I know, and I'm happy that you guys are pushing me to be a better person and been a better uh mentor to others. Uh that is the end of our talk today. Uh I uh implore you to come back tomorrow where we be we will be on with uh Mr. Gusto Bowie or Edward Gusto Bowie. He is a a tribal council member for Bear River. He will be on with us tomorrow along with two new uh, youth and some new mentors. So please make sure you guys check that out. If you guys are looking to see uh, Joe and Milton's beautiful faces again, they will be back on Friday for our youth panel. Um, I also want, before we leave, I wanna shout out uh, Shay and Yvonne for putting this together and helping us out and being there for the, the youth. So shout them out. Um, Mike, thank you for being on here. Boys, thank you for being on here. Uh, everybody else, we will see you guys tomorrow. Have a good day and uh, peace.